You're listening to Peel Talks Housing, the Region Appeals podcast delving deep into complex issues around affordable housing and homelessness and efforts to help residents get and keep housing. Episodes will feature residents with lived experience, Region Appeal staff, our partners, academics, policymakers, and other leading voices in the affordable housing sector. The opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individuals expressing them and may not reflect the opinions of the Region of Peel or the direction provided by the Region Appeals Council. Hello and welcome to Peel Talks Housing, a podcast where we take a deep dive into affordable housing and explore how we can improve the system in Peel. We're glad you can join us and we bust some of the myths surrounding housing and highlight excellent examples of best practice. I'm your host, Axel Villamil, and on this episode, we will focus on whether government policy can help us reach a stage where affordable housing is available for everyone who needs it. We are joined in the studio today with the president of Relosophy Realty, John Pasalis. John, can you introduce yourself to the rest of the team? I own a uh, real estate brokerage in Toronto called Realosophy. We, of course, help home buyers and sellers, uh, you know, buy and sell homes. But I also do a lot of uh, research into the housing market, looking at some of the key drivers that are, you know, driving up home prices, um, you know, to try to make the market a little bit more affordable for Torontonians. Amazing. Next up, we have Dr. Paul Kershaw, of, founder of Generation Squeeze. My name is Paul Krisha. I'm a University of BC policy professor in the School of Population Health, and I co-lead with a range of other academics, important parts of our collaborative housing research network in Canada. And I am the founder of Gen Squeeze, which I'm very proud because Gen Squeeze is a force for, force for intergenerational fairness to improve Canada's well-being, powered by the voices of Gens X, Y, and Z, and everyone else who loves them, backed by cutting-edge research. And housing is a huge intergenerational issue, so it's a key part of our work at Generation Squeeze to restore affordability for all. Amazing. And last but not least, we have Leilani Farha, Global Director of The Shift. Leilani. Well, I'm the founder and the global director of a human rights organization called The Shift, which focuses on securing the human right to housing for everyone, everywhere, uh, global in scope. So uh, no uh, small task at hand. Um, we really are trying to shift narratives and shift action. So looking squarely at um, governments in particular to get them to understand that housing is not a commodity. It is a human right Pro- Prior to being at the shift and founding the shift, I was the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Housing, a post I held for six years. And people called me a global watchdog, um, trying to monitor what was happening or what it is happening on um, ground level with respect to housing and homelessness, and then speaking to all, all stakeholders to try to make a difference. Amazing. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to get right to the housing points that we want to talk to. And the first question is, can housing both be an investment and affordable for all? Or are these objectives at odds with each other? I mean, I don't think they're at odds with each other. I mean, I think uh, housing has been an investment, I mean, for 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 generations. I mean, the, I think the challenge is when you hit a tipping point and when single family homes uh, become, you know, almost exclusively an asset for a lot of people and, and largely more of an investment than as a place to live. I think that's when things become problematic. And I think that's just when um, <clears throat> you have too much money flowing into single family homes strictly for investment purposes. But if that's not the case, if the, you know, if the predominant people who are buying single family homes are just, you know, people who are going to live them, then, yeah, I mean, it'll be an investment over time, probably not as lucrative if you have, you know, domestic and foreign investors buying up housing. Um, but at the end of the day, it's going to be their investment. And I think for a lot of people, I, I mean, that's kind of why they're buying homes. So I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think I, I, think I agree with what John said, um, but I think what we've seen recently uh, in this country in Canada, but elsewhere as well, is a different kind of investment and kind of different nature of investment in housing. I kind I call it the Uber investment uh, in housing, and it's being done by um, big actors, big financial actors like pension funds and private equity firms, and they have so much uh, resources. Uh, available to them and they can harness so many resources. And what they're doing is buying multifamily 
dwellings. So apartment buildings and apartment buildings that were built in the 60s and 70s that have tenants in them, many of whom actually can afford their rent. But the business model of these actors is one that requires rents to be driven up uh, as a return on investment um, to help securitize the loans that they're getting. And so in that way, I do think there is an inconsistency between the business model um, that is being imposed uh, by these big actors and affordable housing for renters. That doesn't mean it has to be that way. I think there are ways to tame that beast. Uh, but I think that that current business model that really is looking for assets that they would call are undervalued. Um, so assets where they could squeeze more rent out of every unit. Uh, that model, to me, undermines and is inconsistent with the idea of affordable rental accommodation. I'm going to pass the baton to Paul now, who's going to who's going to take us even deeper into this. I hope. Thanks, Leilani. I think Leilani and I often talk about the flip side of the same coin, and so Leilani has just been talking about the role of really large actors, pension funds, other large global corporations, thinking about how they can use our housing systems as a, an investment opportunity and then tip the balance so much toward the investment dynamic in housing that we lose the ability for housing to provide a place to call home. Uh, um, and I want to dive deeper on that issue and say, it also happens sort of more amongst regular Canadians to some degree, like homeowners more generally actually contribute to a cultural context where we're right now... We can't say that housing can be as much of an investment opportunity as it maybe once was if we want to restore affordability for all. We're actually going to need to say that housing needs to stall to restore affordability for all going forward. Because over the last several decades, we have been squeezing so much wealth out of our housing system. And many uh, many people who bought into the housing market some time ago have been making substantial um, gains to their home equity while they've been sleeping, eating, watching television. This has had become the norm in Metro Vancouver, the GTA, and then spread to places like Victoria and ha Hamilton and into Peel, etc. And um, we now need to rebalance that and say homes first, investments second, if at all, for a while. And that is the rebalancing that we need to do. But this is actually a massive cultural shift. We need our parties that are running for office right now, uh, federally, and our provincial governments and our local governments to say that our approach to housing can't rely on housing leaving earnings behind in the way that it has. We can't first and foremost want people's equity to grow and then leave so little affordability left over. And I have more to say about what that means for how we have to change our economic growth strategy in Canada going forward, but I'll pause for the time being too. Let's see who else wants to jump in. Yeah, I really like what Paul said about um, stalling. I, I think that's an interesting concept, like just like put the brakes on for a minute uh, and and or a couple of years and like let's let's yeah, it, maybe it's till 2030. Um, but I also want to pick up on something he said, which I think is super important. He was alluding to it. And then at the end, he got there, which is housing and the way our housing system in Canada and elsewhere has been used is not just about housing. It's really been used as a way to drive the economy of Canada. And I think what Paul is suggesting is, hey, wait a second. Housing is home and we need housing to remain home for people. And maybe we need to find other ways to drive our economy rather than through a mortgage based housing system and investment driven housing system. Um, I don't, don't want to put words in Paul's mouth, but, you know, I, I that's where I would I that's what I've been thinking about recently. Once we get our heads around the idea that housing is really about finance, it's about the economic right now, finance and the economic health of the country, that then enables us to start looking at where we need to make changes. Where should the solutions come from once we understand how much it drives uh, our economy and and the inequities in our economy? Presently, real estate rental and leasing represents the largest part of Canada's economy. 
It represents 14% of our gross domestic product, which we might be perfectly wonderful if about 14% of Canadians found employment in the same sector. But that's not the case. Fewer than 2% of Canadians find employment in real estate rental and leasing, which then raises some really important questions about our approach to growing the economy. What we're effectively doing right now is organizing our GDP to grow because governments like that. And, you know, it, it, it's a high level indicator that can help drive revenue generally for our tax system. But what it's ultimately doing is growing the major cost of living faster and faster and faster, not producing sufficient jobs in that industry to spread the uh, the share of the economy it represents amongst a large enough number of workers. So then earnings fall behind. And as a result, then hard work doesn't pay off. And this is what has happened over the last several decades, that we have driven up the number of years and years and years you have to work to save a down payment. If homeownership is out of reach, your consolation prize is rising rents. And that's because we have tolerated rental and real estate and leasing being 14% of the economy and almost none of them employment. And that is a wonky approach to economic growth. It's one way to do it, but there are better ways to now grow our economy that would say, let's recouple the, our major cost of living with what people earn and use that to spur um, growth in other industries, hopefully ones that will also make us greener so that we can read our, reach our uh, net zero goals by 2050. Oh, I mean, that would be great. It sounds like there's a lot towards the economy and in the housing market and, and things that we can do to, I guess, um, moderate this. Uh, but I would love to, you know, from your perspective, John, how would you think that with with the suggestions that Paul and Leilani were talking about, how would that affect the current market of real estate? How would they react to that? If we did take that pause, what would that look like from, you know, the real estate side? I mean, there's, there's two segments. I mean, when we look at the resale market, I mean, I, I don't disagree with uh, with either of them. I think at the end of the day, I think something that uh, I think federal policymakers should should have been moving towards is, uh, you know, making it harder for for you know people to be buying single family homes strictly as an investment, and in many ways tightening credit, making it harder for those people to load up on real estate, and eventually easier. Uh, for first time buyers to be buying homes. And I do think that's important. I mean, at the end of the day in Canada, one in five homes are bought by investors, which is an unbelievably high number. Um, and I think we do need to move to a market where uh, more homes are bought to be lived in. And I think, you know, one of the challenges, of course, is that for, for you know, decades, we haven't really been building rental housing in this country, at least not in the GTA. Uh, so a lot of the rental housing has been filled by condominiums, and which is why there are so many investors in the market. And I think one of the big things that we have to do is, of course, and we've been do, you know, Trudeau government's been doing this recently, encouraging more purpose-built rentals so that more of the rental supply uh, is in fact coming from that segment of the market, not sort of single-family homes in, and mom-and-pop investors. Absolutely. Paul, Leilani, your thoughts? As we think about altering the way in which housing is used to grow our economy generally, we still then want to like shape the housing system, the housing market to produce the right kind of supply. And without doubt, we're going to want to move more towards building purpose-built rental um, because that is a kind of tenure for those who are not going to be lucky enough to get into the ownership system where they can s approximate the security that ownership often provides to people. Whereas to use John's language of mom and pop, you know, they'll often maybe have a, a second home that they'll rent out or a condo they rent out. But when it meets their life course needs or the price point to cash out gets to a point that looks good to them, then they will make it based on their own financial needs, uh, which can then put the renter into a place of insecurity. Purpose-built rental has a very different business model. And that absolutely is important uh, in terms of saying, hey, we want renters here for the long term. And so it's been important that the CMHC and the current uh, national housing strategy has been prioritizing rental. But of course, I'm going to pass it over to Leilani to observe some of the challenges about how we attract uh, investment into purpose-built rental, ideally new purpose-built rental. So we're not replacing what exists now, which is often the most affordable supply. But Leilani's going to knock that out of the park better than yeah. me. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I will, but I'll try, Paul. And thanks for the baton. I mean, it's it's the, the issue of supply is always a thorny one uh, for me um, as a human rights lawyer, because, um, and Paul, pointed to this, right? It's just, it's not just any old supply that we need. It's not all, it's, and it's not even just purpose -bit built rental that we need, but it's purpose built rental that people can afford. And, and so the supply issue, you know, you, 
there's a lot of talk in the media around, oh, so, you know, if we just build enough supply, everyone will be happy and prices will come down because the market will be flooded and all this stuff. And I mean, I think we know trickle down economics is dead in the water. I mean, I think, I mean, even the IMF and, you know, the big proponents of trickle down economics have said that doesn't work. We know that there have been places like Vancouver, where in fact, if you look at, um, New builds, not necessarily of rentals, but new builds generally supply. It's not been that terrible, but the prices continue to defy that supply side economic theory. So, so just to say that when we talk about supply, I'm very much in keeping with Paul. It ha- it has to be purpose built rental, and it has to be affordable. And so then we can get into that conversation. Well, what is affordability? And that's where the big developers have won the day, to my mind, so far. So they want affordability generally to be measured against what they could otherwise get in the market, right? Market rent. So they'll say, oh, 80% of market, I can live with 80% of market rent if you let me build five more um, stories and all of this stuff. They are really winning the day. And um, even where they move away from 80% of market rent, they're going to like using median um, incomes for an, an area. And in a in a wealthy city like Ottawa, where I live, for example, that just doesn't work because you're still then not building for the most in need. If you take a, a person in receipt of social assistance who's making 50% or, you know, entitled to 50% less than any poverty measure in the country, right? Person in receipt of disability benefits the same. So, um, there, there, there needs to be a real drive toward genuinely affordable housing. And that's based on what? Household income, what a household can afford. I've seen in other jurisdictions, and I'll stop here, but I've seen in other jurisdictions where they really look at categories of um, people. So based on income brackets. So they say, well, we have X number of people in receipt of social assistance, and we know that there's real need for affordable housing for those folks. Well, they are none of them are going to be able to pay more than $200 a month on rent based on what they receive from social assistance, right? And then you take the next category of workers, janitors in in elementary schools. How much do they earn? What are they able to afford? It's it's a it's a flip in how we deal with affordability. Absolutely. I think it's, you know, down to the math and down to the numbers, we can clearly see there's an imbalance and that there, you know, investors are coming in. Canada is this store for the wealth to go ahead and invest. And I think what I've been hearing from everybody is that there needs to be moderation. There needs to be you know, um, purpose built rental properties, um, and as well as that, we have to have affordable housing. Uh, and we need to figure out how we're going to actually do that with a current economy and how these investors come in. So there's a lot to go in. But you know, Leilani, you touched on a great point in terms of the income of these households. So I think my next question leading up to that is who really gets left behind when we treat housing as an investment? And you've already touched on that a little bit, but would love to go deeper onto the people that are left behind. I mean, from my experience, I am, you know, fortunate enough to have a job and uh, you know, working a couple of businesses, but it is still very hard as a millennial, as we grown up to be, you know, it's hard for us to actually acquire a house um, at our age and the way the economy is built and what we're, you know, working with. I can only imagine what it is for other people um, in other circumstances. So would love to hear everybody's thoughts on this. There's a, a massive intergenerational tension in the heart of our housing system. It's actually the same intergenerational tension that's at the heart of our climate system. And for that matter, actually, in our budget system, uh, uh, if, if you'll just let me to just sort of paraphrase on these three issues so you can see the connections, because it's the same systemic intergenerational villain operating in all cases. So in climate change, we know that for the last many decades, we have been over consuming the scarce capacity of the atmosphere to absorb carbon. And so we We've got to a point where there's very little capacity left. And so we've left for younger Canadians and future generations, almost none left over. And so they have to make massive adaptations to how they're going to heat their homes, travel to work, where they're actually going to find employment. And that's a massive constraint on their standard of living going forward. In our budgets, we have been, you know, there's some federal election going on. There's not a single party right now that's talking about balancing budgets, which is actually really interesting because that means we want more and more, but we're not necessarily willing as a society, a very prosperous society, to pay for 
for all of those bills now. And so we talk about punching the bills down the road. So that's over consuming available resources now, asking people down the road to take on the cost later on. So bring me back to housing. For the last several decades, we have squeezed massive amounts of wealth out of our housing system, which is what has reflected home prices rising higher and higher and higher. I am a perfect example that I've been a homeowner now for over a decade. I live in Metro Vancouver. BC Assessment tells me that my home has gone up hundreds of thousands of dollars in a single year in certain moments. It's made me more wealthy, but the same person who's as smart as me, who's as talented as me, who can work as hard as me, but they're just 10 years younger, can't live where I do. And so we have been squeezing at all this wealth and leading less affordability left over. And here are the stats that showcase just how hard we are making it for younger demographics so that their hard work doesn't pay off like it used to. In the mid-1970s, when many baby boomers were coming of age, my mom was a young woman at this time. It took the tickle of a young person in this country, in this province where I'm coming from, BC, in Peel, and in Metro Vancouver, the most expensive region. It took around five to six years of full-time work for a typical young person to save a 20 20% down payment on an average priced home. But if you flash forward to today, across Canada, it takes 14 years. In Ontario, 18, BC, 20, the GTA, 23, uh, Metro Vancouver, 28 years. That's just years and years of extra work that is now being lost to young folks. And uh, for many, the dream of, of homeownership is then put out of reach. And you know what their consolation prize is? Rising rents. And so then you have a generation of uh, talented, well, often, you know, many of whom well-educated folks are landing decent jobs. They can't do home ownership, so they're pursuing the rental. They're going after, and so then they're going after, they can't even afford market rental sometimes, so now they're going after the affordable rental. And then they start to outcompete those who are more working poor. The working poor then have to go after the social housing that we'd initially hoped would be there available for the, those who are homeless, street homeless. And suddenly now there's less uh, supply of housing supports for those who are especially marginalized. And so you can just see how the lack of affordability in the system generally creates more competition for what's affordable and then exacerbates the challenges for those who are most marginalized. And that is how the generational problem intersects with class issues. And I'll hand it over. Certainly, the, these escalating prices, uh, I mean, of course, are, are very problematic for people at the, the lowest end of the... I mean, if you're making minimum wage in Toronto, you can't afford a place to live on your own. I mean, it's so expensive. But I think what has happened over the past couple of years, it, it, it has kind of creeped into this new segment of the market of people who have good jobs and make great incomes and can't buy a house, you know, and I had, you know, a couple email me uh, maybe a few months ago. I mean, they had a dual household income of, I think, $120,000. They had a $100,000 down payment. And, you know, when we looked at the data, I mean, their max budget was $700,000. And when you look in the entire GTA, there's basically nowhere where they could buy a three bedroom home for their family, like nowhere, like 3% of all home sales. We looked at it were under 700,000 and those were well over an hour away from from the city or an hour and a half commute and most of them were fixer uppers. So, and 120,000 is well above the median household income in the GTA. That's not a modest income. So you have two people making a good income and they can't afford a home for their family. And then on the flip side, they have nowhere to rent really because we're not building family type rentals. You know, I I mean, in theory, they could rent a home, but again, that's not particularly secure because if the owner wants to move in, they get kicked out. If the owner wants to sell it, they get kicked out. So they're, they're, and, and this is one of the challenges for renters. They end up moving every couple of years. And then the costs and uncertainty are also problematic, especially if you have kids in school. Um, and I think it's a, it's a huge problem right now, just across the, the, the whole spectrum. I don't think it, I think it's a, a impacting all households right now. And I think because house prices have gone so high in markets like Toronto and Vancouver. Yeah. And I, I think what John says is super important. I think it does. It is. It's it's a huge swath of our population. But I will say um, where human rights are concerned and, and the reason I keep bringing them up beyond the fact that I'm a human rights lawyer is that governments do have human rights obligations, particular obligations to um, ensure certain groups of people are uh, protected by human rights. And if you look at this um, clash, excuse me, class generation um, 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 description that Paul 
provided us. Um, what you find then is that race is very much part of this as well in indigeneity. So you end up with those who are like, you have to look at, okay, who are the renters? Because renting is the last stop before what? Homelessness, right? So if if renters are being priced out of their own homes and out of the market generally, um, who are our renters? It's Indigenous peoples, racialized peoples, people in receipt of social assistance. It's persons with disabilities. It's newcomers and migrants to Canada. Um, you know, it's single mothers. All of the people who are protected by our human rights code and protected by international human rights law. And so governments have a particular responsibility to ensure those groups do have access to adequate, affordable and secure housing. Um, so I am I, I am concerned about everyone who is being denied housing. And I I go right where John goes and where Paul goes a hundred percent, but I also am particularly concerned about these other the, about the marginalized groups because if they are forced out of rental, where do they go? Okay, the next stop actually is an SRO or you know something like that, some kind of hotel accommodation or a shelter. The next stop after that is a car, if you're lucky to have a car, and the next stop after that is the is is parks, encampments, etc. Or maybe the car comes before the shelter, but whatever. It's pretty bleak. I just got back from Toronto, actually. I was visiting um, encampments, homeless encampments in the parks. And, you know, everyone wants to say, oh, well, those folks are people with um, mental health issues and drug addictions. And, and where some of them are, some of them have those situations and those characteristics, because they ended up in homelessness, they were working at a medical clinic, they were working in, um, you know, as a janitor in a school, and they've lost their housing. And so uh, we have to remember every homeless person was once housed somewhere. Absolutely. It sounds like everyone is affected. That's it. Really, at the end of the day, the ones who are unfortunately, not wealthy enough to to afford um <laughs> housing and especially at the rate that you spoke about that couple that just shocked me mm. and at the same time makes me sick to my stomach because how am I gonna you know I, I think about not only myself but as Leilani said all the other marginalized um, individuals that are, are dealing with this and it's just such a huge issue I saw Paul you had your hand uh, up that you wanted to uh, go in and have a final point Oh, I'd love to just add some color to a few observations. First, let's just uh, John's observation about, hey, you know, this, this family could afford a 700,000 plus home, and yet there's nothing in their price point for that. Let's just show how big a change that is. When my mom started out in the housing system in the mid-1970s, the average price home adjusted for today's dollars would have been 250000 so now people are having to deal like with, you know, they can afford like three times that they're being asked to come up with. And that doesn't get you enough rooms to actually raise your child outside of a closet. That is a real deterioration in the standard of living uh, for generations. And then it goes to, you know, then they start to outcompete uh, those who have lower income. And it plays out along uh, the class, the racialized, and I would also add, you know, gender lines as well, uh, because uh, women are disproportionately poor in this country. So then we have to engage with what Leilani is saying. And so Leilani is rightly telling us we need to scale up the supply of not for profit housing. We desperately do. We should double it, maybe triple it. Let's quadruple quadruple it. The amazing thing is, imagine Canada was that uh, accomplished and we did quadruple the amount of below market housing. You'd probably get us to about 20 to 25 percent of people are now relying on some sort of subsidized housing, which means you still have the vast majority relying on the market. And so we do need to think about how we're scaling up the below market supply of housing dramatically, but also fixing the regular market by adjusting the dials. And that is sort of like dialing down some harmful kinds of demand. We've been talking a little bit about that. We need to dial up the right kinds of supply. John's been super strong on that. Like we need the, enough spaces you know, to, to rent and then rent with enough bedrooms, et cetera. And we need to dial up protections for existing renters. But the last thing I'd like to just say Axel, as you said, well, everyone's affected. And then I worry with that observation because you just let off a whole bunch of people off the hook. Everyone's implicated, but a, a large proportion of Canadians are benefiting 
because of home prices rising, we are getting more affluent. And yet we never talk about the wealth issue, the wealth that's being grown for companies and big pension funds and the wealth that's being grown for regular folks. And if we don't talk about the wealth, we are not going to crack this nut open and actually stall those home prices. And this is the fundamental failing, in my view, of the national housing strategy. Never once does it mention the word wealth. So it always suggests that rising home prices is a problem. But many, many Canadians will tell you, no, it's not. I like it when home prices rise. And that's the tension that we need to focus more on. No, absolutely, Paul. I, I completely agree. So, I mean, that begs to the very next question. I think it sounds like everything was rehearsed here because you're beautifully setting me up for everything I'm about to ask, which is how do we free housing from its role as an investment, but create the supply for housing purposes that we need? This is like the question. I mean, I think I think it's I mean, obviously, there's it's it's a complicated topic and there's no silver bullet. I mean, I think um, I think, like I said, I think it, there are roles for for, you know, federal, uh, municipal and provincial policymakers. I mean, at the federal level, I, I said certainly, like I said earlier, I think there's room eventually for, you know, the federal government to be tightening credit on investment properties, people buying specifically single family homes. I mean, if they're buying triplexes and fourplexes, you know, that's one thing, but single family homes, certainly if they're buying as an investment should be harder mm -hmm. in the future uh, and eventually easier for home buyers. And I think on, you know, I think the the, the purpose built rental, I mean, I'm going to let Lani talk about that, how to build very affordable ones. But on, on the municipal side, I mean, I think there's room for um, significantly more density. I mean, a, a lot of the neighborhoods in the GTA are, are specifically zoned for single family detached. And, and that is a huge problem. Um, at, a, at a minimum, you know, we should be allowing two unit housing. I mean, the, the federal government recently just or liberal government announced, you know, a program to to incentivize multi generational housing and, and giving tax incentives for that. The problem is you can't build multi generational housings in much of Toronto, like it's just not allowed, right? So we need, you know, municipal and provincial governments to encourage multi generational housing duplexes, and eventually even at least allowing semi detached homes now where they're not allowed, you know, there's no reason why we need massive detached homes in every neighborhood, you know, we should be allowing more density and encouraging that. So I think there's a lot of things both provincially and uh, federally that can be done. I think the starting point is a genuine, not a fake, <laughs> a genuine commitment to understanding and acting on the idea that housing is home and is not an investment or an investment vehicle, nor is it a commodity, uh, nor is it an instrument of finance. OK, if governments actually took that on board, then all the policies that flow around finance and housing and their intersection would be very different. That's embracing a human rights approach. Right. If you if you govern from a place of human rights, you end up with very different policies. Um, so I can give you some examples. Um, you know, we have a tax system right now that privileges real estate investment trusts. Those are the big um, financial vehicles used to purchase multifamily apartment buildings. And it is the attractiveness of those tax breaks and the tax regime coupled with cheap money thanks to very low interest rates and John was alluding to this you know rates that are so low that that money is basically free for these guys and it's that coupling that makes its housing such an attractive uh financial investment so pull the plug Change the tax re regime. Look at monetary policy and the setting of interest rates so low by the Bank of Canada. Address that through fiscal policy if you have to, if you can't control the Bank of Canada, right? So, or, or convince the Bank of Canada that they're actually not doing Canada well by setting interest rates so low or certainly not doing renters well or um, wannabe first-time home buyers, for example, young people. Um, I think I, I'm going to end here, but to say that I think the pandemic exposed a lot. It, it it really drove home that we have a housing crisis in this country and a homelessness crisis, for sure. But it also exposed that 
governments can print money. There is a thing called quantitative easing. <laughs> there is a way in which governments can find the resources to do what's necessary for the health and well-being of a nation. And, you know, just as they were able to purchase respirators when we needed them and get them across the country to hospitals, governments, all levels of government can find the resources necessary to create new supply, protect existing supply, repurpose buildings to create new supply, something we didn't talk about, but I, I am a big proponent of repurposing office buildings and hotels and even shelters into longer term housing. Um, so um, we start with the commitment to the right to housing and we end with the political will to find and spend those resources. So, I mean, I'll ask you a couple of questions because I'm curious. I mean, um, I'm, I'm, I try to understand why, you know, profit and, and, you know, institutional investors are, is the, is the problem because I don't see it as that. And arguably, I feel like one of the problems in Canada has been that governments haven't been mindful of, of profit. At the end of the day, the reason developers have been building condominiums and the reason all our rental supply has been coming from condominiums is because it's more profitable. And the second the federal government stepped in and allowed cheaper loans to build purpose-built rentals and in many ways made it more lucrative to build purpose-built rentals, we saw more purpose-built rentals. So I don't, I, I guess I'm trying to understand how the, the housing market works in an economy where housing is built by private investors if profit, I mean, sh you know, is kind of demonized or shouldn't be allowed or is part of the problem, as you say. I don't demonize. I only read um, the facts, which is that we've seen a huge influx of big capital into multifamily, existing multifamily dwellings and in building new builds. And the result has not been an increase in affordability across the country. I mean, I think we can agree there's there that we've seen unaffordability across the country with these actors doing what it is that they do for profit. And so so um, the current model clearly isn't working because we've landed ourselves in a housing crisis and really an affordability crisis. And while a few of us were lone voices on this for a long time, any party that has come out with a housing platform has identified affordability as a huge problem across the nation. Whether they're able to address it, that's another question. And so um, only to say that I think um, we do we should fix what's broken. And it's clear to me that that it is broken. Um, I think there are um, both nonprofits and community based organizations that are well placed to engage in the production of housing. And they say that they are ready. There's cooperatives, there's all sorts of land trust movements, etc, who are ready at to engage in the production of truly affordable housing. And so we do need to harness that. I think we need to increase the amount of public assets that uh, the, the government has on their book, not the government, that governments have on their books. I mean, this country is has in the Western developed world, one of the lowest rates of social housing. Uh, and social housing is necessary. I've not in my career been a huge proponent of social housing, social housing. I've, I've just not, that's just not been my career because I really believe um, that we have to work with what we have, which is a private market um, delivering housing. But at some point, we need more social housing. There's just no doubt about it, um, where our rates are so incredibly low and the stock is getting very old uh, and has to be rehabilitated. Yeah, thank you, Leilani. I mean, and John, great points. I see that, Paul, you've been waiting to jump in on here on uh, especially what John said. I uh, would love to hear what your thoughts are. I think John's asked this really important question about what's the role of profit in the housing system. And I think he might have been interpreting Leilani suggesting that there was no space for it. And that's not entirely how I interpret Leilani. Um, I think, John, you actually answered the question some, in some of your earlier remarks. It's about the, the relative balance here uh, between housing providing a place to call home and a return on investment. And and uh, what's been happening is that we've been running out of balance and that our housing system has been generating windfalls. So when we talk about, you know, a 
profits that are sort of, you know, the kind of profits that you're finding in other parts of the economy. And, you know, people are paying their mortgage and there's a small escalation in home prices over time. And people build up a little bit of equity that they can count on for their savings uh, in retirement. You know, I think that had been what Canadians had imagined from the housing system. But we've abandoned that some time ago. Were we to return to that after we had some stalled home prices for a while so home prices could catch up? Pardon me. So earnings could catch up to home prices. Um, you may, maybe we can revisit that conversation. But I think it's the relative balance. And and I have long argued that we should be trying to channel private investment for public good, including, you know, thinking about some of that private investment from abroad, not even in Canada. And how do we get that into purpose-built rental? And it's through Leilani that I've realized it had to become more nuanced in that observation because we want to channel that private investment to build more purpose-built rental without replacing what's affordable and existing right now. And that's a nuance that I think very few people have brought to our public dialogue in Canada in the way that Leilani has done and that we are in her debt for doing so. And then if we take a step back more generally to the question that Axel was putting towards us, like, how do we restore this affordability? How do we like, how do we break the investment relative to a place to call home relationship so that we start reemphasizing the place to call home? And uh, Leilani joked that I might have a five point plan. I, I probably do. And I'm going to start at the highest level in, the, in this case with like guiding principles. If we get the right guiding principles, we're probably going to uh, get the right outcomes. Leilani has emphasized housing is a human right. This is an important principle. Again, strong voice. Many people have been um, galvanizing around Leilani's efforts on that front. John was talking about uh, let's make room for everyone. Let's, you know, resist the nimbyism. Let's actually start worrying about the zoning that isn't permitting us to build the density that's required to develop the right kinds of supply this right at this moment in places where there isn't enough supply, where there isn't enough rental, so that we don't have to simply add more supply where there already is existing affordable rental. So make home for make room for everyone would be another principle. I think John's been emphasizing that. You've heard me and I think everyone at certain moments say homes first investment second. So it's a prioritization of what we first and foremost need out of our housing system, a place to call home. We don't need it to be a way to get rich. There might be some room for some investment returns in between though. All of that is going to require us to scale up dramatically the not-for-profit supply of housing. Nevertheless, the majority of Canadians are going to rely on the regular market. And so we're going to have to fix that. We're going to have to adjust down the dials of harmful demand. And we're going to have to adjust up the supply of the right kind of supply, enough bedrooms, enough purpose-built rental. We're going to have to adjust up protections for renters. But we're not going to be able to do any of that if we don't break Canada's addiction to high and rising home prices. Because if we keep tolerating housing prices disproportionately driven by land prices rising, we make it much more challenging to scale up the not-for-profit supply. We make it much more challenging to deliver market rent at affordable rents. And so we need to have a conversation about who has been winning from the housing system in recent decades. It's not just the last couple of years. I don't want to push John on that. But it's not just in like 2018 and onwards. We've been seeing this since like the 2000s onwards. And it had been a slow and steady ride from the mid-70s. And if you look at it historically, we've, we've got to reorient towards breaking our addiction between high and rising home prices so that we want home prices to never rise again faster than local earnings. John, sounds like they, <laughs> <laughs> they went to your question. No, I, I mean, I think those are all fair. I mean, listen, I think I, 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 I agree with, with uh, I think it was the three-point plan in the end or the guiding principles, as, as you called them. Yes, that's it. I mean, I, I, feel, I feel like one of the tensions is that, you know, when we look at what's going on, and maybe I'm more cynical, like at the end of the day, um, and I can't remember who said it, I think is both of you that that housing has been driving our economy, right? And, and that's just the reality. I mean, the combination of rising home prices, the home equity loans that people take out of it to renovate their houses, um, you know, and it's, you know, I'm, I'm trying to imagine a world where that stops, you know, and a, and a federal government that actually wants it to stop. Um, and I don't know if I've seen anything uh, yet from either party that really wants it to stop personally. And, and I think a lot of them say they want to and they'll say they promise things that make people feel like it's going to stop. But at the end of the day, you know, governments 
get reelected when the economy is going well and the economy is going well when house prices are rising. And I think I think this is kind of one of the tensions. I mean, and listen, I don't I don't I don't think that is the way forward. I mean, obviously, I mean, especially like, you know, know, with this with with the way the market is right now, I don't think that's the way forward, but it has been. So I'm just it's going to be interesting to see a government, you know, take on that position. And I don't think any of them have yet or have indicated they want to do that so i mean we'll see what happens <laughs> i'm kind of i think paul wanted to say something so i'll pass it over well i just think that axel we need to make sure you tweet out those observations from john i think they are fundamentally important right now that we have a range of platforms talking about a range of important policy tools many of which uh, people like leilani myself and john have emphasized uh, in previous years but if we don't get clarity on what we want from home prices to deliver affordability, how we want that to relate to our approaches to growing our economy, we are not going to likely achieve this goal of affordability for all by 2030, which is this lovely, audacious goal that the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation has put out for us. And John has nailed it. How do we grow our economy? Because if we just grow GDP, and we're so excited about GDP because housing is contributing to that, we miss really when an economy is working. Right now, when we grow our economy by growing the uh, rental real estate and leasing industry, All we're doing is making hard work not pay off for the vast majority of people. Sure, governments can claim the GDP is going well, but that is why there is a groundswell of generations of millennials, Gen Z, and actually some younger Xers is that this is not working for us. And that is becoming a fundamental tension on why you see all parties right now competing to say, yes, we're finally listening. The deck is stacked against you. And so I think there's a moment now where we can shift our approach to how do we grow our economy? And this federal liberal government actually has has created a quality of life framework to uh, inform its budgeting decisions, to try and move beyond GDP as the only metric. This is a critical moment. We need to actually celebrate that and recognize that actually stalling home prices so that earnings can catch up is fundamental to improving the quality of life for many, many, many Canadians, and that that should be the sign of when we are growing our economy. In other words, an economy works well when hard work pays off more and it's sustainable over over time. The role of rental real estate and leasing right now is dying, doing neither of those things. It's not creating a sustainable housing system, and it's definitely not letting hard work pay off over time, at least for those people entering the housing system. I, re- I really love what you just said, Paul, and I, I think you um, it, it really, you, you provided it in such a crystallized way, and, and I thank you for that. We, we say in my world, um, the world of financialization of housing, that um, it's it it is unproductive it's not part of the productive economy and some people have even said the the financialization or i should say excuse me finance has itself been financialized in other words finance is just about generating more finance and more finance it's not productive um and i just want to lob one thing in and this is like maybe kind of out in left field and i haven't thought this through so I don't know, but, you know, I think you're figuring out on this podcast so far that I'm kind of messy in the way that I think. So one of the things that I've always been surprised about is that as home prices, like home ownership, so you own your home and as your home supposedly gains in value, I mean, it's all on, it's all a myth, but anyway, supposedly gains in value, your property taxes go up because your property gets assessed based on market value. And I don't understand why people don't react against that. Because for exa- if I take my home, for example, I purchased my home in a neighborhood in Ottawa. It was like a kind of cottage, um, working cottages neighborhood in, in historically in Ottawa. And so uh, lots of little small cottage homes on the Ottawa River, the Kitchissippi River, as it used to be called. Um, and, you know, it's just become this like incredibly hipster neighborhood. Um, I've been here for, you know, 18 years or whatever, but it's now this hipster neighborhood. So with, I get these property assessments and it's like, my property is worth like three times, four times what I paid. I don't take 
I don't get happy about that because I I look at what my property taxes are and they're escalating enormously. But my income has barely changed since I moved here. So I'm now having to pay more of my income on my property taxes. I don't understand why more people don't get outraged by that or I'm not outraged. I'm just scared. I don't want my I don't want the value of my property to keep going up because my income will never go up in, as Paul has said, in this to to the same degree that my property value is supposedly going up. So um, this is one time I'm going to disagree with Leilani. Um, I think that Leilani in this case is actually misrepresenting a bit about what's happening with tax policy in Canada. So first off, there actually is quite an outcry in lots of cities where home prices have had more of a tradition of going up from people like, I don't like my property taxes rising. But the degree to which property taxes rise relative to actually the increase in wealth that people are getting is like a drop in the bucket. And so we are... So, you know, oh, I don't want to pay that increased property tax, which actually is often moderated for a range of reasons. And the wealth that people are nevertheless accumulating is much, much more dramatic. And then this is where you actually are wrong, my dear friend Leilani. Um, uh, it is straightforward for people to actually access the equity in their home, their entire industries. Like, go check out like the chip home income plan uh, oriented towards those who are over fifty five. Um, and there's this lovely commercial. Hey, you know, we could we could uh, borrow against our home, and we should get a hot tub. Do we want it inside or out? And the commercial says, "Why not both?" Because this is the crazy way in which we so facilitate people being able to borrow at historically low interest rates against their equity in their home. So it's very straightforward these days to turn your home into a good bank teller and pay almost no interest rate on it. And here's the last point. Tax uh, municipal taxes are relatively modest. Like over the last several decades, as home prices have been going up and up and up and they're like worth trillions more in aggregate. Um um, annual property taxes as a share of our economy is going down. And we shelter people's principal residences from taxation like we don't shelter any other asset. And so our tax policy incentivizes regular Canadians to treat housing not only as a place to call home, but a good tax sheltered investment strategy, which then contributes to a cultural orientation to commodifying our housing. And so since I've been provocative and I haven't yet said this thing that always gets me in trouble, it's time for our country, if we are going to resist adding a capital gains tax on housing, which all parties have said they'll never do for some time. And I get hate mail every time I would raise that. But at least we should go to the, you know, the 9% of homes that are over a million dollars in Canada right now and say, could you contribute slightly more to annual property taxation so that we could raise the money to start investing in purpose-built rental that is affordable, that is below market and start scaling up the uh, supply of non-market housing and take the people who have been winning the most, myself included. I live in one of those homes. Ask me to contribute more so we can dampen down the, the, the prices at the highest level and simultaneously uh, generate revenue to invest in affordable housing. That's a win-win. Great points and a very interesting turn in the conversation. And, and, and John, I want to I get you on this. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and I'll agree with Paul. I mean, at least in, in Toronto, tax, property taxes do not go up very much. I mean, my house is probably tripled in value in the 12 years that I've owned it. And my taxes have gone up maybe 20%. A lot of this is certainly concern for seniors who own their home. I think that's a misguided view. At the end of the day, like Paul, like at the end of the day, there are programs or even if you can't afford it, I mean, if you have a 1.5 or $2 million home, you have equity in your property. So, you know, most of the people who own their homes outright have some means of you know, using that capital to potentially pay for higher taxes. But, you know, Toronto's not doing that. Plus, we allow seniors to defer their uh, their property taxes in, in all sorts of ways. So we don't need people to find the money until they sell. So if they're income strapped and house rich, no problem. Easy ways to accommodate. Yeah, but the ways to accommodate is so interesting to me because um, I, so I have clearly not played the game properly because in, we do have higher property tax rates in Ottawa than you do in Toronto, for example. But uh, and my property taxes have gone up, certainly not commensurate with my income uh, and probably you're right, not commensurate with the value of my home. But you're suggesting that I play the financial game, someone in my situation, play the financial game, feed into that financial system, drawing on the equity to pay my taxes, which I think there's something problematic there. But maybe that's for another podcast, Axel. (laughs) 
Tell me. I absolutely do think it is for what I mean, very nice of all three of you, because I would love to go to the next question as we wrap up to the final 15 minutes of this podcast, which is we've gone through so much together on this podcast. And I think uh, all three different perspectives on, on, on how we're you know handling this idea of affordable housing and what we can do to actually make that happen. And I just want to leave uh, the conversation with this last uh, tidbit of, of, of uh, follow-up questions, which is, can you three identify the top three things that municipal governments must do to fix this? So, I, I mean, I think, of course, at the municipal level, there are only so many things that can be done. Um, but I'd say the the top things are, you know, kind of going back to what I said earlier, I mean, certainly uh, a shift to policies that allow for more density in neighborhoods that are currently only allow single family detached homes. Uh, and I think that should be a combination of both allowing, you know, multifamily homes, so duplexes, for example, and even semi-detached homes. I mean, there's no reason why 50 foot lot should not be severed into two 25 foot semis. I mean, at the end of the day, you have twice as many people living on the same piece of land. Uh, and I think that's a, a, a very easy way to move forward. It's not relying strictly on big developers who are building condominiums. Again, we're building more family type housing, which is what we need. So I think that's one thing that should be done. Uh, and I think the other thing I think that, you know, uh, Paul had kind of touched upon and we talked about is is potentially thinking about um you know property taxes on housing i think i think one of the challenges i mean no one really wants a tax increase i mean i think that's kind of what lani was saying i mean no one wants to see their tax bill going up but uh, i feel like if 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 municipalities were doing this uh, and specifically were using the money for housing uh, i feel like it would probably be easier to sell and and because I, I think most i mean at the end of the day i think most people who have homes uh, are have benefited significantly from uh, rising home prices i mean i wouldn't lose sleep if my property tax bill went up a little bit um, especially if you know where that money's being used i think one of the challenges again i think you know i think the average homeowner doesn't want to just see a, a rising tax bill but if i think it's if it's going towards especially for affordable housing i think i think it'd be a lot easier for for people to accept agreed i think it's proper explanation and it's just yes. a stigma around the word property tax you know mm -hmm. that everybody doesn't like but once they know there's a lot more to it um paul Leilani. okay i have three things I'm going to start with uh, the most uh, so two granular and then one kind of zoomed out. So uh, at a granular level, I really think that uh, municipalities are in a position to I guess this is a two part recommendation. But I think they, that that cities need to know who owns their city and who owns the residential housing. Each and every city and town across Canada should be doing an audit. What do we have? What don't we have? Who's living where? How much do things cost, et cetera? I don't think such a thing exists at the you know across the country. And I think it should be every city and town should be doing these, these audits. And from there, um, I think that what we'll find is that some cities have vacant homes. Uh, and I think some, not all, but some of those vacant homes could be harnessed and used in whatever way to address some of the housing shortfalls, whether that's through vacant home tax, which some cities are doing, uh, or whether that's through working with the owners, the ghost owners of these vacant homes to say, hey, you got to you got to cough this up into the long term rental market. I think that kind of thing should be happening. So more creative approach around vacant homes. I also think um, what we'll find is, especially now in this pandemic period, uh, we'll find that there are buildings that could be repurposed, that bu buildings that have been abandoned, whether they're office buildings. And, and we've seen in, in at least one of the political platforms, this idea of uh, throwing some money at the repurposing of, of office buildings things. Um, and I know CMHC is interested in that. So I do think that repurposing because the need is so high and it's immediate. And I'm, I'm looking for solutions that cities could do, could be engaged in immediately to address need that wouldn't take too long. And then the last sort of zoomed out thing, if I were a mayor, I would be um, really demanding a new uh, intergovernmental table on 
homelessness and housing affordability. Um, it doesn't exist at this point. It has to be all levels of government and all in, uh, because I really think that the housing crisis in the country won't be solved without better communication, cooperation and collaboration between the different orders of government. Well, I will affirm uh, the suggestions from the, my two fellow panelists, and I will um riff off of them. So at the municipal level, without doubt, the most important policy they tool they have available is zoning. And we need our municipalities to be bold and resist NIMBYism, even though the elected officials at the municipal level are most subject to the pressures of politics at the local NIMBY level. Nevertheless, resist that, make room for everyone and think about having um, to build on a Leilani's audits. Let's just do needs assessments and 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 recognize that we have to have pl uh, official plans that are going to tolerate something like, you know, four floors and corner stores throughout our neighborhoods as sort of a minimum and start planning to uh, elevate supply accordingly. Now, when we start to open up zoning that way, we actually are at a municipal level and for the province, the federal, like we're, at, we're printing wealth. When you can start to add density in our neighborhoods, then you are literally making those properties more valuable. And so we need our municipalities to come together and join forces to say we need to revise our tax system, likely in partnership with our provincial and federal governments to capture the windfalls for the public that come when we uh, zone to add density. This is going to be critical. Make sure that the public gets a decent chunk of that windfall when we're printing wealth by adding zoning and adding opportunities for density to put into social goods like affordable housing. And then I'd say... Last but not least, municipalities need to use their voices to come in common cause to champion a vision of growing Canada's economy in our cities in ways that rethink the role of real estate rental and leasing and to draw attention to the problematic way in which real estate now is the biggest part of our gross domestic product, 14%, but fewer than 2% of Canadians find employment there. That gap is harmful. It's an approach to economic growth that is making hard work not pay off because because we don't produce earnings that keep pace with home prices. We need our cities to join forces with other advocacy organizations to call for a different vision of growing our economy and then demand that every political party running for office at a senior level of government right now say, yeah, we will imagine a different approach, which is going to involve, at least for the medium term, home prices stalling to re uh, restore affordability for all. And I'm, I'm going to I'm going to add one, one more policy I just thought of um, much, much stricter. Uh, policies and policing around short-term rentals and Airbnb rentals. I mean, I think what the city of Toronto has done uh, is the right approach, which is generally only allowing people to lease out on a short-term basis their principal residence and not more than six months out of the year. Um, because I can tell you before that, the number of people who, you know, had condominiums and were renting them on Airbnb rather than to long-term tenants was unbelievably high. The number of investors who were actually renting out condominiums and accumulating a portfolio of 10 rental condos, taking them out of the long-term rental pool, and then renting 10 of these units as a business as Airbnbs was also unbelievably high. Uh, so I think these are behaviors that we want to curb, and we want more of this housing into the hands of people who are going to be living in them. If I could do a shout out, Jen Squeeze has done good work on short term rentals and actually coming up with toolkits for cities across the country to use. I would pass you off to a former colleague of mine, Eric Swanson, who has been leading some of that work. Fair B, &B does that. So if anyone's listening to this podcast from a municipal standpoint, come to jensqueeze.ca. We can send you there. And also to champion Leilani's idea about taxing empty homes differently. Jen Squeeze worked with the city of Vancouver to introduce the first empty homes tax in all of North America. It's an easy, straightforward path to like popularize that to municipalities across the country. Country. So that wraps up this episode of Peel Talks Housing. Thank you to our guests, John Pasalis, Leilani Farha, and Dr. Paul Kershaw. Uh, thank you to our listeners. And you can find information on our podcast at peelregion.ca. And you can join the conversation on the Region of Peel's social media accounts. Thanks, everybody, and had a great conversation with you all. The opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individuals expressing them and may not reflect the opinions of the Region of Peel or the direction provided by the Region Appeals Council.